This is Health Yeah, your weekly update on what's going on in the health, wellness, and medical world with Monica Robbins. It's a condition most Americans have never heard of, and it affects millions. There was times where I would completely collapse to the floor. Every time I stood up or bent over, it felt like my body's check engine light would come on. Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS for short. It can take a once active person and leave them homebound. It's often misdiagnosed and brushed off as an anxiety or panic attack. That's one of the reasons a lot of individuals aren't diagnosed quickly. We dive into this disorder to bring awareness to a debilitating condition that often gets overlooked and help you advocate for yourself if you suspect you could have POTS. It's all straight ahead on Prescription for Life. Welcome to Prescription for Life and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Monica Robbins. We started hearing more and more about POTS during the COVID pandemic. It's often called an invisible disease, but it's very real to patients who experience a racing heart, lightheadedness and dizziness. And it's incredibly frustrating when it sometimes takes years to diagnose. But that's exactly what's happening for millions of people. We'll get into more of the symptoms and questions to ask your doctor in a moment. And a little later, we'll show you a story of a colleague who experienced POTS uh, live on the air. Uh, Diamond uh, was... <sighs> but first, again, POTS started to gain more attention during the pandemic. COVID-19 pushed it to the forefront when many long COVID sufferers began experiencing these symptoms. I talked with a Cleveland State student who's living with POTS. Here's her story. We met Marissa Duran last summer, a standout volleyball player at CSU, sidelined by the aftermath of COVID. There was times where I would completely collapse to the floor. There's been other times. The most common for me now is my vision will go out and I'll just kind of hold on to something. Marissa is the face of COVID long haul patients, young, healthy, but not immune. Doctors diagnosed her with POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. It impacts blood pressure and heart heart rate. Doctors say it's becoming a frequent diagnosis in post-COVID patients. They had mild COVID and then they recovered. And then a few weeks later, they developed these symptoms, the lightheadedness, fatigue, racing heart rate, brain fog. Most of them are women. The condition debilitated Marissa. Her volleyball team played on without her. Not only could Marissa no longer play, she could barely move. My parents had to make me breakfast. My parents had to make me lunch. I have to sit down in the shower, like just very limited in what I could handle. Like there was times where like my mom had to help me walk up the stairs to my bedroom. Oh, it's heartbreaking, um, especially for young individuals like Marissa. Marissa's cardiologist, Dr. Tamana Singh at Cleveland Clinic, says post-COVID symptoms impacting the heart can last weeks. But in Marissa's case, it's been more than a year. She's now taking beta blocker medication. I will say it did help me a lot. It was the only medication that was able to bring my heart rate down and not give me a whole bunch of extra negative side effects. Dr. Wilson and his team now have a data bank filled with long COVID POTS cases they're studying with findings ready to share at a conference with other physicians. We've sort of sort of thumbprint and identify patterns in these patients to really create this awareness. Again, mild COVID. They weren't necessarily debilitated, more of women than men. Things we see maybe as risk factors, common symptoms. With sports now out of the picture, Marissa is moving forward, focusing on a health sciences major. Her current assignment, a paper on her own condition to help others understand the impact on her life. At this point, I think most people would, you know, look at me and say, oh, she's totally back to normal. And to an extent, I do agree with that, but it's not the normal that I used to be used to, really. Now we dive deeper into the signs of POTS with our Cleveland Clinic expert. Watch this. Joining me now is Kyle Shannon, who is an advanced practice nurse with Cleveland Clinic Neurology and Neuromuscular Medicine. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Monica. All right, we are talking about POTS. Let me see if I got this right. Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. You got it. That's a mouthful. What does it mean? 
So as the name says, it's postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. When you stand up, your heart begins to race. You also will have associated symptoms often of dizziness, lightheadedness, and feeling faint. So this sounds like a heart thing. So there's, uh, it's the predominant symptoms are cardiac, right? And when people say that their heart is racing, you would think maybe I should go see a cardiologist. But our department works very closely with cardiology because we wanna make sure, obviously we wanna make sure there's no cardiac ab abnormalities that could be causing the symptoms but it can be managed by either neurology or cardiology. Wow, so how does it happen? So the first and foremost, it's a very female dominated disease. It's roughly four out of five individuals with POTS, if not even more, have, uh, are female. Uh, there's roughly about three million people that we know of in the United States that have POTS as of recent. Um, I suspect that that's because people are not diagnosed yet. There's probably many more people that are actually dealing with this diagnosis than are actually accounted for. So what's actually happening in the body, right? When we stand up, all of us naturally have a drop of the blood. Everybody, healthy or not. But when uh, we stand up, our body is able to sense that drop and is able to try to help push the blood back up. Your heart rate goes up a little bit. Not, not, not uh, enough that you notice it usually. Um, your leg muscles squeeze and contract and help push that up. And then the nervous system helps, specifically the autonomic nervous system, um, helps to regulate the blood pressure by telling those blood vessels, squeeze tight, get that blood back up to my head and to my core so that I don't get any symptoms. And this is all a bang, bang type of thing. It's very quick, you, you don't even have to think about it. But in an individual with POTS, again, usually we work with cardiology, usually the heart is healthy. They'll get, they'll get normal tests done, they'll get EKGs, they'll get echoes, and those will look usually okay. I still recommend getting them, but usually they're okay. Usually these individuals are able to walk around. It's not that their leg muscles aren't working. It's something affected the nervous system. Something caused that nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, to not be able to fire correctly and to send that signal to those, those blood vessels to squeeze and push the blood back up. Explain the autonomic nervous system. Yeah, so when you think about the autonomic nervous system, there's two big portions of it, right? There's the, what we call the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic, think of that adrenaline type of sensation, fight or flight. You are uh, running for your life, your heart's racing, you're sweating, you're shaky, you feel as if um, you feel threatened. You, you feel like you can only focus on one thing and that's survival. Then you have the other side of that, that's the parasympathetic, which in, we, in layman's term, we call the rest and digest, right? It's the body is, a, it is in a state of calm. So the thought process in POTS is something has caused the sympathetic nervous system to go awry. And that's why these individuals get the symptoms they get. They get shaky, they get sweaty, their heart starts racing. Um, and we have to try to do our best to re-regulate that. It sounds like a panic attack. Yeah, it does. I think that's one of the reasons a lot of individuals aren't diagnosed quickly. Um, unfortunately, I think because of bias in the medical system still, when a young female comes in and says to you, my heart's racing, I'm short of breath, uh, I feel shaky, I'm sweaty, most people would immediately jump to Oh, that's anxiety, that's a panic attack. But I think it's important as healthcare providers to sit back and say, well, wait, what's the circumstances surrounding your symptoms? Because certainly if you're just saying, Monica, you say, I get worried about something and then my heart starts racing, okay, then maybe we need to have that conversation. But it, when it, the conversation is more, I stand up, my heart starts racing, I'm dizzy, and or I can't, act, I can't move around like I used to. I can't exercise like I used to. I just feel like I'm gonna faint or I feel very fatigued and exhausted. Then it's a whole different conversation. We're looking more in that POTS realm. But I think because we don't always ask those clarifying questions or patients don't know how to express their symptoms that 
we go that route of mental health first, which obviously that's a big thing, right? We need to focus on mental health, but we also don't wanna miss these other diagnoses that are treatable. So for those younger women who maybe experience something like this, if they do go to the emergency room, because that's typically, oh my gosh, maybe they did faint. Or, or chest pain. Or, or chest pain, or they fell down or something and they're thinking something is very seriously wrong. What? What's the, what's the phrase? What is the thing you really want to say to make them? Because what, they're first going to check your heart and yep. that's going to come back fine, right? Typically, typically, yes. So I think when I, if I had to give advice to people, it's be descriptive. You can't just name a symptom, describe the symptom. Try to take the time, especially if the healthcare provider is listening, right? Take the time to say, I was standing, all of a sudden I got dizzy and lightheaded, or I just made a posture change and then whoa. But if I sit down, it goes away. I think giving that description will help lead a healthcare provider's mind to say, okay, wait, it's not, it's not an uh, anxiety attack. So I remember I did a number of stories on this during COVID. What was it about COVID that seemed to cause POTS? Or was it these people already probably had it and COVID just exacerbated it? So there's a few theories on that. Um, first and foremost, POTS has been around for a long time. This isn't a new phenomenon. Uh, COVID did not start POTS. Uh, POTS was first phrased actually in the early 1990s um, and was probably around much, much, much before that. We used to see it commonly after like people getting mono or uh, the flu, or somebody who got really ill and was in bed for a long period of time and got really deconditioned and weak. Um, the thought process though with the viruses is that there's a big inflammatory state in the body. And then that autonomic nervous system just gets confused. It almost flips a switch and just turns it from being able to go back and forth between the sympathetic and parasympathetic, that fight, and fight or flight or rest and digest, to only being the fight or flight response. So people really um, could be affected by, by COVID. And I think the reason we're seeing so much of it is was the amount of viral infections in such a short period of time. So what are the treatments? Are there any treatments? Can you get over this or is this something that once you have it, you gotta deal with it? Early recognition is key. I think the quicker we can start treatments, the better the outcome. It's the same with almost any diagnosis, right? Treatments can be conservative measures, as well as in some individuals, we use pharmacologic therapies. Um, in terms of what is the generalized POTS patient population gonna hear, and anyone that does a Google search can find this, they're gonna hear, you need to hydrate. You need to increase your electrolytes, specifically sodium. Utilize compression garments, these stockings, these socks that help push the blood back up. And they're gonna hear exercise. Um, so to speak to the first two points, like the increased water intake and the sodium intake, why do we tell people to do that? Everyone's like, well, I, I don't get it. So there's some thought processes behind POTS that, other, that some people may have what we call low blood volume. They just, their blood pressures can be low. They don't have enough blood volume. So we need to increase that and water helps do that. And sodium also helps with the water to keep it in the body. You, can't over, you don't want to overhydrate without sodium too. You need to balance your electrolytes. And it also helps to actually boost the blood pressure. A lot of our POTS patients have a tendency towards hypotension, low blood pressure. So that helps with that aspect. The exercise part, part is probably the key. And this is where a lot of patients get frustrated and um, discouraged. Because how would, I, how would you feel, Monica, if I told you, just go over there, run, a, run on the treadmill, even though you're feeling dizzy, lightheaded, you're gonna faint and your heart's beating out of your chest. You would probably not be happy with me. Right. <laughs> so we have to do a very structured exercise program. It has to be guided. We actually use programs like cardiac rehab. A lot of individuals who have had like open heart surgeries before, um, they, do, they go through a similar program where it's a very slow reintroduction to exercise to get the body accustomed to moving again, getting those muscles strong, getting the heart back and able to help regulate the uh, blood pressure and the heart rate so that you're not getting asymptomatic. Some people are able to go right to cardiac rehab without medications and just using those conservative measures. Others do sometimes need medications. Medications vary from patient to patient. I would not say it's a one size fits all. Uh, it's a conversation to have with somebody who's trained in POTS to discuss like, okay, how do we wanna go about this? If you're low blood pressure, we can't use certain meds that could lower it even more. Maybe we need to try something that actually increases the blood pressure. 
Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense as to why I, I knew a number of younger women who were athletic. Mm -hmm. And typically the athletic women have lower mm -hmm. blood pressure, which is why, you know, you it was so surprising to see them dealing with this. What can they do? Is there any way to prevent this? It's hard. I think the best thing you can do is just focus on wellness. It's like you already alluded to, it can affect healthy people. It can, it, it can affect people that do everything right, eat right, sleep right, exercise. At the end of the day though, we can't always predict what's gonna happen in our bodies. So I don't think there's a way necessarily to say, if you do this, this, and this, you will never get POTS. However, those type of things will definitely help in reducing your chances. So what about, you said early intervention is, is key. What about for that person who, you know, goes to the emergency department or sees a doctor and tells them and they're just kind of written off that, I'm sorry, you have anxiety or that was a panic attack yeah. and it continues. What happens if you don't get treatment for this? Well, a lot of patients because of the symptoms, they don't feel good standing up. They sit down more they lay down more, their body gets weaker. And the, as the body gets weaker, remember we talked about that second pump earlier, those leg muscles helping to push that blood back up. If you're not using them, the muscle's going away. So it's gonna get, now as they stand up, it's gonna get worse and worse and worse, their symptoms. So I encourage people to try to f look up things to try to figure out who can actually treat for, or work you up at least, and figure out if you do have POTS. There's actually a great organization called Dysautonomia International. They, if you type in to their, you can actually search for a provider and put your area code in, and they can actually identify sites that, that actually do workups and treat for POTS. So it, it's a great tool to use, because again, this can affect anyone anywhere. Is this a good warning sign for those women who know that they already have low blood pressure to just be aware of that they could be at higher risk for this? That's a great question. I've had a lot of patients who come in with low blood pressure that are female and for whatever reason, they were made aware of POTS as a potential. I don't think that you're more predisposed with the hypotension, uh, but a lot of those individuals do get lightheaded and dizzy too, but they don't necessarily meet the criteria for the diagnosis of POTS, um, which I don't think we actually talked about yet. So POTS is diagnosed by um, doing what's called a tilt table test or orthostatic vital signs. What that means is we have you lay down for several minutes and we take your blood pressure and heart rate and we average it. And when you stand up, we monitor those blood pressures and heart rates minute by minute by minute. And if the heart rate goes up by 30 or more beats and consistently stays elevated, not a, not a one-time reading, but consistently stays elevated above 30 beats or more, that's how we make the diagnosis of POTS. It's that simple? It's that simple. You can do it in, you can do it in your primary care's office today if you need it. I'd recommend doing it for roughly 10 minutes standing if you're able to, and then you can see what the heart rate's doing. Are you concerned that there, there are a lot of myths and misconceptions about POTS out there or just a lot of people don't even know about it? Uh, I would say there's two things that worry me. One, I, a lot of people still are not aware of it. COVID has certainly brought more light to it, but again, people are not as aware of it as they should be. The other thing is I think that because of the symptoms of the anxiety and the depression, People and, and this big focus on mental health, which again is very important, I still think that people f push those patients more into that mental health box instead of actually taking their physical symptoms that they're experiencing. Um, and so I do think that POTS sometimes gets ignored. Is there a difference, uh, like just off the top of your, of your head, between POTS and a panic attack? Oh yeah, certainly. A panic attack, you could be laying in bed at night and wake up and think about something that scared you or some experience you had in the past and you'll get the symptoms. POTS is primarily when you're upright, standing, doing things, moving around. If you lay down, it goes away. It's a very clear distinction. Wow, what about food? Does any food have any impact relating to POTS? This needs more research. I'll, I'll be quite frank. It's something that really I'm very, um, very health conscious and what it actually really annoys me is patients ask me this question and I don't have a good answer. Because, and, I, and I'm so focused on what I put into my body. Um, so what I try to recommend is that they follow very healthy lifestyles, like using a Mediterranean style diet, 
avoiding foods that have a lot of preservatives, avoiding foods that are high inflammatory foods, um, which if you were to look up a diet, like a low inflammation diet, it would probably provide people a lot of benefit. And the rationale behind that is, right, we talked about POTS is caused by a high inflammatory state in the body, post-viral, if we can do something to lower inflammation in the body with things that we do on an everyday basis, such as eating, it could probably help. Most patients hate me as well because I say, limit your carbs. Try to avoid pastas, try to avoid breads and glutens because when you intake those foods, they're complex carbs, they're difficult to digest, and it requires a little bit more blood flow to the stomach and it can drop the blood pressure even more. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, final thoughts. What do you want people to uh, take away from this conversation? I would say if you're having symptoms that we just described, make sure you go to someone and bring up the concern of POTS. I think it's okay to be an advocate for yourself and say, I think I have this. Now again, the individual may not believe in that, but go use the resources available like I just uh, spoke about, like Dysautonomia International to find someone near you that is able to treat for this. and. Um, don't give up hope. There are people out there that'll help you. And uh, that's what we're here for. And the low inflammatory diet and the Mediterranean diet is just, we should all do that regardless. If yeah, we, probably. If we have pots or not. Yeah, my wife would be proud of me for saying that, yes. All right, <laughs> Kyle, thank you so much. Yeah, of course, it was my pleasure. A colleague at our TV station in Scranton, Pennsylvania, lives with POTS and had a fainting episode live on the air. WNEP's Emily Kress explains how she struggled to find answers. Get the news voice warmed up. Here we go. Three, two. My job as a news reporter keeps me busy, traveling around northeastern and central Pennsylvania telling stories. But behind the scenes, I had medical struggles I couldn't explain. Every time I stood up or bent over, it felt like my body's check engine light would come on. I got really dizzy and I had this tunnel vision and a shortness of breath. Then came the fatigue, brain fog, and a sky high heart rate. It felt like I was going to faint from some of the most basic activities, and sometimes I did. After dealing with the symptoms for three months, I finally went to the doctor to get some answers. Test after test, my results came back normal, but my symptoms got worse. One of my worst fainting episodes was captured on camera in this very parking lot. I was waiting to go live when I suddenly got lightheaded and things escalated very quickly. Newswatch 16 anchor Lisa Washington was on the desk that evening. There was just something in your delivery that caught my attention and I thought, something's not right. Like, what's going on here? So she's physically not Investigators okay. Here in Luzerne County say the death of 14 year old um, uh, Diamond uh, was. <sighs> that day I knew I needed to push even harder for answers. The seventh doctor I saw was Dr. Deborah Sundloff, a cardiologist with Lehigh Valley Health Network. It only took her a few minutes of listening to me describe my symptoms and review my tests to say, you have POTS. POTS stands for postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And it's something that I think is under-recognized. The more you talk about it, the more you'll find that more people have these symptoms and didn't realize there was a name for it. And then you're like, you know, I'm going to see different doctors, cardiologists, you know, specialists. And then you're like, I know what I have. And I'm like, okay, what do you have? And POTS. What is POTS? I'd never heard of it. POTS is a form of dysautonomia, meaning it impacts all of the things your body does that you don't have to think about. Blood pressure, heart rate, breathing, temperature regulation, the list goes on. The vast number of symptoms makes this condition difficult for some doctors to diagnose. It's a bit of a masquerader in that a lot of women or even men will be diagnosed with anxiety or palpitations or something like that instead of really getting to the root of the problem is that you have an autonomic dysfunction. After posting about it on social media, I learned I wasn't alone. In fact, someone who sits across the room from me experiences the same thing. I was kind of just like, oh wow, like I just got that too. And like, wow, here's somebody else who has it. Maybe they'll know like what I'm talking about too. Stephanie O'Malley is a producer here at Newswatch 16. For her, symptoms started with a shortness of breath. Then things got worse. I like stood up really fast and I got like really dizzy and then I just passed out. 
and I went to the emergency room and no one could figure out what was wrong with me. Stephanie had a similar experience. It took four doctors to finally put a name to her symptoms. It's estimated nearly three million people in the United States have been diagnosed. Of those diagnosed, 90% are women. We're not really quite sure what causes POTS, but it seems like it could be brought on by pregnancy, trauma, a major surgery, or viral infection. And we have actually seen it with COVID. There is no cure. Doctors rely on symptom management to help patients. Things like high fluid and salt intake and some medications. But even with lifestyle changes, the symptoms can still persist. Some days you're like, all right, well, I'm taking the medicine. I'm eating what I'm supposed to eat. I'm doing everything. But like, it's still like terrible today. And it's just kind of hard to go on with your life when you still have to deal with all this stuff, even though you're doing everything you can do about it. POTS isn't rare. It's just rarely heard of. We hope starting the conversation will help others. Now more people know what's going on. Now we can all talk about it. And now maybe we won't have to wait so long to figure out what's wrong with us. Emily Kress, Newswatch 16. And I'm glad we're talking about it now. That's all for this episode of Prescription for Life. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back here next week with another dose. Until then, wishing you and yours good health. Thank you so much for tuning into Health Yeah. Please find me on Twitter and Instagram at Monica Robbins. Like and follow my Facebook page, Monica Robbins WKYC. Find video podcasts at Monica Robbins channel on YouTube. And please subscribe. Wishing you great health and hope to see you again soon. Thanks for listening to Health Yeah! with Monica Robbins from WKYC Studios. Subscribe now so you never miss an update. And find more on everything you heard here on WKYC.com and on the WKYC app.